All right, good evening. So it looks like we are getting all set right here. So while I am getting ready to introduce our main speaker, Dr. Tange, this evening, I'd like to introduce Ruth Oliver, who is a current senior in material science and engineering. She's gonna introduce herself and share a little bit about what she likes about material science while we get started with Dr. Tange. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're really excited to have you here and get to talk about all different things um, that we can use materials for, specifically within um, the holidays, but also just in all the ways that materials affect our life. And I can definitely speak to that. Um, as a senior in materials engineering, I've been able to spend the last three years of my life um, learning about materials, studying them, getting to do some research and so it's been really great um, to see all of the ways that not only as a materials student, but also a student at ASU um, that I've been able to pursue um, my education and do so many fun things. Um, so I will first say that I am so happy that I am a student in the IRA Fulton Schools of Engineering um, for all of you guys, whether you're seniors in high school um, and just trying to decide where you're going to go, what your next steps are, or whether you're a student already in school or whatever it may be, maybe you're, um, you've already finished your schooling. Um, I definitely am so glad that I chose to attend ASU and to study materials um, just because Fulton has given me such a wide variety of connections and opportunities. Um, uh, currently, I am actually working on my honors thesis project, which is connected to material science, and I'm working on that with um, one of our professors in material science and engineering, and I'm actually working on making um, nanotechnology materials themed activities um, that we're going to release virtually. Um, so that's a really cool experience. And she actually does research with um, thin film materials. So basically taking um, some materials that have really interesting properties when you get them down to the atomic levels and have thin atomic sheets um, and you can use them for all different sorts of things. For example, that's actually what my research centered on um, is I studied using what we call a two-dimensional material um, because it's only one atom thick. And we can use um, materials that are only one atom thick for special applications because they have different properties than they do in their bulk. Um, so for example, something like graphite compared to graphene. So graphite is the material that is commonly found in pencil lead. Um, so I'm sure you guys are all familiar with that, um, carbon-based and it has that like kind of shiny metallic look to it, um, but it's not a metal, it's carbon. So when we say pencil lead, it's not actually um, lead because that would be poisonous for you, um, but it is graphite. And so when you take graphite and um, you actually layer it into a two-dimensional sheet, so where it's only one atom thick, um, we call it graphene. And the cool thing about graphene is it's actually conducting. Um, so it conducts electricity, which normally this isn't true of carbon materials. Um, it's more common with metals, like how all the wiring in your house is made out of different metals. Um, and so that's what's really neat about graphite versus graphene is we see how something that has one property in its bulk or large form has a different property when we get it down to be really thin. Um, and then we can use it in research. We can use it in all sorts of different applications, whether that's electronics, making things really small because the smaller things are, um, the faster that they can go, um, the less energy they use. And so that can be really applicable, whether that's in phones or TVs and computers. Um, so we can use graphene in all sorts of different ways. Personally, the research that I was able to do was with a two-dimensional layer called tungsten disulfide. So the two elements were tungsten and sulfide, and they form a layer structure um, that actually is able to be used to emit light. Um, so you can take these sorts of materials and apply them in all different sorts of ways. Um, and that's just like one of the things that I've had experience with as a student um, in the Fulton schools and as a student in materials. Um, and so there's lots of other ways that we can use materials um, to shape the world around us, whether it's, uh, like I said, in electronics, um, just harnessing those materials properties um, to be able to do all sorts of really cool things. Um, and so I think that's definitely the main like point of tonight, the thing that we want to get across to you guys, and we hope that you're really excited about as well. 
Thank you so much, Ruth. So um, welcome again to our wonderful event about holiday cheer for an engineer. I do appreciate your patience while we're navigating some of our technical if, uh, difficulties this evening. So joining us this evening, we'll be hearing his voice, but unfortunately we're not going to be able to see him as the star of our show tonight, who is Dr. Tongue. So I am going to be sharing Dr. Tongue's slides and we'll be able to hear his voice um, from our uh, attendee pool. So I am going to um, I'll introduce it to Dr. Tongay. So Dr. Tongay is um, one of our uh, wonderful esteemed faculty with the IRA Fulton Schools of Engineering. He is the department chair of our material science and engineering um, group within the school for the engineering of matter, transport, and energy. So this evening we have a wonderful uh, bit of information prepared for you. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tongay to introduce himself and I'll be sharing his slides that we've prepared this evening. All right, Nina, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let's look at these slides, huh? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right, so I wish you guys could see me, um, but this is the holiday cheer with an engineer. Of course, when we talk about engineers, um, they're just boring people. And we talk about boring stuff, but we are not that boring actually. And we wanted to show you how we can be nerd uh, but fun at the same time. And today what I want to do is I want to just say what material science and engineering is. And I want to be able to show you a few things about Christmas and the holiday season. Two of which most important ones to me at least is Christmas lights and snow. So let's look at the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, um, my name is um, Sefet and Tongai. I'm the chair of this department right here. So you cannot see my face. So you just need to look at that face right there and imagine it talking. I'm in my office currently. I was in the laboratory just now. And in the next, please, um, you, my actually Starbucks name is Seth. So you can refer me as Seth. Next, Nina. So. Before we start the fun stuff, I just want to be able to tell you what material science and engineers do. At the end of the day, we want to create entirely new materials. We want to design them, we want to develop them, we want to manufacture them, and we want to test them to improve our lives. Let's look at some examples. The first example is switchable glasses. You imagine a glass. We can coat these glasses with something called graphene, and my student Ruth was trying her best to be able to describe those just a moment ago. We can coat it with it. And when we apply electrical voltage, we can immediately switch it to get some more discretion. And this will be switchable glasses. And this is not hypothetical. This is a real example right now. It is on sale. Let's look at the next example. Uh, the, in the next example, Nina, we are looking at Adidas uh, foam. So for example, we have our shoes. Oftentimes we do not think about what is underneath. We think that it is just a little bit sponge that is bouncy and it is beautiful and it is this, this, that. But in reality, a lot of materials engineering, polymer science and manufacturing process goes in it so that it performs well. This is material science and engineering. In the next example, we are looking at materials for healthcare, for example, if your loved ones broke their bones, and I've broken my bones a bunch of times because I like cycling and hiking and such, and I'm getting old, of course, um, you will need implants. And you may say, well, it is an implant, it's a piece of uh, metal. Well, you're wrong. The reason is if the implant has a different flexibility than your bone, and your bone is flexible, you know it, otherwise we would break it each time, if the flexibility is different, all of a sudden you will create many fractures in your bone, even though you have an implant in it. So that's material science and engineering. In the next example, we are looking at materials for energy. We look at solar panels. Those solar panels, any solar panels you have seen was a product of material science and engineering. And in this beautiful image, what it shows us, it goes from an atomic scale all the way to crystalline phases, large scales. We play from atoms to macro scales to be able to create this uh, energy conversion devices. And sometimes we are not very productive and we are not very creative. Then we look at the nature. Right here, you're looking at one mosquito head. 
we get innovation from those um, creatures and we look at under scanning electron microscope, SEM, which we will learn today a little bit. And we look at how their eyes are made out of and we make our optical devices and optics based on that. That's material science. And the next example and the last example that we wanna give is materials for future. That means sometimes you cannot imagine what you can do, but you can think about materials that's gonna revolutionize in 50 years. I'm talking about, for example, quantum computers. When we talk about quantum computers, you cannot use silicon anymore. You have to come up with completely new materials. That would be our job. That'd be material science and engineering. What I like about material science is that how similar it is to people. There's a famous saying in material science. We say materials are like people. It is the defects in them tends to make them interesting. And we, as humans, we are not perfect. We all, all have our imperfections. But that makes us us. We are unique. In material science, to make materials unique, that's precisely what we do. We make them imperfect. If you go to San Diego and look at the sand, that is silicon oxide. You purify it, you make it a silicon. Then, as material scientists, we incorporate these foreign atoms in it. You're seeing in purple and brown to make them into conductive silicon. Only then it becomes an electronic device. And in the next, you will see that we play with processing structure and properties and this and that from many different scales, length scales. Let's look at the next uh, one, please. At different length scales from nanometers all the way to macro, uh, micrometers and macro scales. That's material science. But that's not why we are here today. But important piece is, however, can we go back very quickly, uh, Nina? The important piece is we need to understand how material science came into these lights. And this is just one example. There are many examples out in the uh, real life and you will see those examples. So in the next slide, let's look at it. The question is very simple. Have you ever wondered what is in these lights? We wanted to answer that. To be able to answer, we did the hard work and we have taken and broken one of these glasses. Nina, if you click one more time, this is the broken glass right there. It's just imagery. This is not our data. But let's look at in the next one. When we broke it, on the outer crust that you're seeing, I'm not sure if Nina is going to be able to point the um, cursor right there. Yes, that's the outer crust. That is the broken glass piece. Can you click one more time, Nina? Uh -huh. One more time, please. That's the broken glass. That is right there. And let's click one more time. We're going to explain it more. We're going to zoom in right here this piece. And that's part, that's the part that makes the light. Let's zoom in here, Nina. That's what we are seeing. We're going to zoom in more. We are using scanning electron microscope to be able to look at a closer, closer look at this coil, what this is. This is even closer look. Right here, what you're seeing here is the coil. And right outside, there's a couple of dusts. You see that. Those are not dust, actually. When we broke the glass, that glass basically deposited on this coil. Those are the basic silicon oxide pieces, remainder of the glass that we broke. But we, want, we don't wanna stop here. Let's click on the next one, Nina. Let's look at the atomic elements when we look at these coils. Okay, we've seen it, but what is in it? Using scanning electron microscopy and, scanning, uh, and spectroscopy measurements, actually we can determine what elements goes in it. Nina, could you point out to the red segment that you see? That's the segment. Let's click one more time. As you can see, this is made out of copper. And if you look at the red color, coloration at the very end, at the bottom of the page, it says copper CU, mm -hmm. that's copper. So if you click one more time, Nina, in this image, basically what we saw was copper wire and it is attached to a coil, and we will know what this coil is in a minute. Let's click on the next one. One more time, please, Nina. Right here, we are looking at the coil. And as you can see in the spectroscopy data, 
Let's look at tungsten, which is W. Nina, can you look at the spectroscopy data that says tungsten exactly? That is tungsten. And it shows that majority of it is tungsten. You will see AU, which is gold, that is, we deposited that so that we can collect better imagery. So that means this coil is actually made out of tungsten, it may say gold, that gold is actually not there. We put that gold in there. Let's go in the next slide. That is the tungsten coil that we are talking about in regular tungsten light bulbs. Let's go to the next one. So that all of a sudden becomes our gold and tungsten, but please remember, gold is only on the outside. We deposited that so that we can collect all this beautiful data. It is made out of tungsten. Let's go to the next one. And when we look at, one more time, please, Nina. When we look at this silicon droplet at the bottom of the, exactly. Right here, when we do the elemental analysis, we have found that these two copper wires are attached by a silicon droplet and it is tied together using a, a polymer-based holder. It is just so that when you shake it, you just, these copper wires are not loose because if they were to be loose, you would just easily snap your tungsten coils. That's the role of it. Let's click on the next one. One more time, please, Nina. So what is happening is this Christmas light that you're seeing is just like traditional filament light bulb. You pass current from one end, it passes through copper, and then it passes through tungsten coil. Then it hits the tungsten coil. These electrons scatter so much that they heat up and they send this light. And that light passes through the outer crust, which is the glass piece, colored glass piece, and then you get the light that you want. Well, that's good. Let's look at the next slide. We didn't want to stop here because we wanted to know how about the LED lights. The, what we saw was tungsten light. Now we're going to look at the LED lights, which is a little bit cooler because you can control them uh, using your iPhone, for example, using apps. When we talk about LEDs, what LED means is light emitting diode. Diode is basically on-off device. Diode was invented not by an electrician, but from by a material scientist, by the way. Let's look at the next slide. This is closed dissection of the light emitting diode or LED. You will see that there's an epoxy lens case on the other side right there. It allows it to have a different colors or just focus the light a little bit better. But on the inside, it says, again, you have anode and cathode. It is in the middle section. It is the copper wires in a sense. It is attached by a gold wire to LED chip. Exactly, that is right there. Thank you, Nina. Nina, have you taken your uh, material science degree? If not, I'm gonna totally hire you. That's <laughs> definitely, that's what's gonna happen because you're, you're a wonderful so teacher. Here. I know. So right here on the, on the outside of this LED chip that is all the way to the right, you will find actually there's gonna be some uh, phosphorescent particles that enhances the light. Please remember about these phosphorescent particles. Please do, because I'm gonna show you some cool images later on. Let's click on the next one. Excellent. Now we are looking at, again, SCM. Let's look at so those images. Let's keep looking at it. One more click. One more click, please. Excellent. As you can see in LED lights, this is indeed what you see. Let's click one more time, Nina one more time and one more time. At the bottom, all the way to the left corner, this is the LED device. It has three segments, which I will show in a moment. In that particular LED device that you saw, please look at these wires that's going in and out. It is similar to tungsten wire, tungsten foil, except those are made out of gold. And if you look at the middle segment, that middle segment, I'm talking about all the way to the uh, left still, Nina. In the middle segment of that device, you will see three sections, three stripes. Those are gonna be red, green, and blue light. I'm gonna show you hopefully in the next slide. Let's look at the next slide, please, Nina. 
When you pass current, as you can see those sections emit the light. Those would be the LEDs. I want to mention something here. The LEDs that you see in your uh, on your computer screen or on your, uh, let's say, uh, beautiful uh, TV would be the same technology here. You would want to make red light, green light, and blue light to span all over the color spectrum. Let's look at the next slide. Right here. This segment is gallium nitrate. That's a Blu-ray technology. When we talk about Blu-ray discs, this is the gallium nitrate. This is the special semiconductors that materials and engineers have developed. Let's click one more time. In the middle segment, we are looking at red color. That is gallium arsenide. That's a gallium arsenide semiconductor. Again, it is a revolution of material science. Green is gallium phosphide. This is also material science. And do you remember the phosphorescent particles? Look at them. Look at how beautifully they have arranged themselves. We call it self-assembly. Let's click one more time, Nina. All this data set was collected using SEM, which is scanning electron microscopy. It's a microscopy technique that we have here at ASU. We didn't want to stop here. We didn't want to also play with fake snow. We wanted to look at real snow. You're looking at real snow right here. This is a false image. Of course, snow doesn't look this beautiful color, but we wanted to show you something cool that looks different. What you're seeing here is how water basically froze in the SEM at cryogenic temperatures, at low temperatures. What I like about this image is the following, actually. When I first saw this image, can we go back, Nina, please? What I like this image is because if you look at the snowflakes and look at their shapes, on the other parts, you see hexagons. As you can see, what this means is this crystallization happened right around negative 17 Celsius. Nina, can you show that uh, sectored plates? It is right there, exactly, that one. And Nina, can you do me a favor so that we can accept you directly to MSC program and find that sectored plate on the SEM image that we are seeing on the left side? All right, that's a little bit more tricky. <laughs> I know, but I, I know you can do it. Look at that image and look at the biggest flake. Exactly, right there. And look at the second uh, second biggest one. Exactly, look at those edges at the at the... At the very end, it makes a hexagon. And now look at that diagram and find the 17, negative 17 Celsius. Look at that. Look at the similarities. So as such, depending on at what temperature water assumed this snow crystallization, it can take many different flakes. That's why some of the skiing resorts are very popular and some of them are not. If it is nice, needles, they're no good. It is at negative five. If it is dendrites, it is sticky. However, if it is tin plates, solid plates, sectored plates, that is around negative 15, those are the best ones. Those are very slippery. That's why you can ski so fast. That's why some parts of the world, even though everybody pretty much has snow in the north right now, none of them are all ski resorts, are they? That's why it requires special kind of snow. It is platelets. Let's look at the next one. Why I like material sciences, let's play this clip, please. Look at this. It's a simple pencil. It starts from macro. We're gonna zoom in, we're gonna dive in. We are going in. Look at the scales, 10 to the minus two meters, minus three. Let's keep going, Nina. Perfect. We are looking in. We are zooming inside even more. We are looking at the metal alloy on the outside that we never thought about. Uh -huh. We are looking at some of the microstructures. Those are very important. You don't want it to be too stiff. You don't want it to be too slow. We are joining in. We are coming inside. We are looking at these beautiful crystallizations happening. And we are at the 10 to the minus eight meters. Oh my God, we can see 
these crystal structures and all the way down to atomic phase right here. Material science basically dictates all over from the macro scales to atomic scales. We govern it all just so that we can make the alloys in this particular example that is for simple pan. This was done back in 20s and 30s. We did it and it's done. But now we are looking at completely new projects. Let's look at those, please, in the next slide. Military applications. In this particular case, you're looking at water filtration. We designed those filters. Satellite communications. Who makes those satellite panels? We do. Material scientists do. Rovers. We had solar panels. Those solar panels were developed here at ASU. This is a real example. Those um, little um, wheels, the polymer base was ASU. Next one. Right here, you're looking at basically, again, telecommunications. You have mirror systems that allows you to communicate with the satellites efficiently. What goes on those uh, mirrors is material science. Material scientists, we work in a clean room environment, sometimes in other environments. Next one, please. We care about recyclable uh, materials. We make new materials so that we don't pollute our planet. Next one, please, Nina. It can be simple Tonka toys. So what is wrong with it? We make it so that our kids don't get cancer anymore, so that they are safe plastics. Or automotive industry. We play with metals and alloys so that it is safe in it when we crash. Hopefully we don't, but if we do, so that we are not hurt or our loved ones are not hurt. That's all material science. Next one. At ASU, we have an excellent faculty members. We have very low undergrad to faculty ratio or high undergrad to faculty ratio. It's an Ivy League uh, level. It is approximately eight to one. We have faculty members who are National Academy of Inventors. That's a big, big prestige. We have faculty members who have received uh, an award directly from the President Trump for their efforts. We have faculty members working on autism using material science, trying to cure autism or make it better. We approach quantum technologies to renewable energies, to metals, corrosion, electronics, purification, material synthesis, and so on. Next one, please. And you're not alone in this. We have student chapters, such as Materials Advantage and Ruth, is the chair of this Materials Advantage organization at the moment. We meet, we have fun, we discuss material science problems, we interact with each other. That allows us to basically interact um, these fourth year students to third year students to second year students to first year students so that we can create a family like environment. Next one, please, Nina. Where do our graduates go? I picked five random examples that were close to me. Top one is Michael. Michael is undergrad class of 2019. He's currently at MIT. He's a PhD student there. And he has gotten acceptance to so many places. It is unbelievable. Undergraduate class of 18. We are looking at Shifan right there. She's currently at Applied Materials. Current salary is there after she graduated. Masters of Science in 2019. She's, she didn't want to disclose her um, salary, so I couldn't put there, but I can tell that it's uh, definitely PhD level. Kedi, he's working at Applied Materials. That's his salary. Hui, one of my students, he's currently professor at uh, UC Merced, University of California. Let's go to the next one. And I want to stay here. This is why I love material science. You make a little change, but it impacts the world. You want to make an influence. You want to be relevant. You want to make a difference. This is a good place because the little changes that you make has a big implication. That's why I personally and sincerely love material science and engineering. Let's click on the next one, Nina. 
And this is our happy holidays to you. We are nerds. So this is your periodic table, happy holidays. Um, we couldn't find A because in the, on the periodic table, we just don't have just A. So this is your happy holidays. With that, I just want to conclude here. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Tongay. So Dr. Tongay has covered a lot of material this evening, not just our holiday information on the materials side, but also just what does it mean to be a materials science and engineer. So at this point, we've set aside some time to hear from you, our audience. So we're here to help answer any questions that you have. It could be specific to the content we've covered related to our holiday items. It could be um, geared towards Ruth as a, a materials science student, or absolutely ge geared towards Dr. Tange about his research and um, what, he, what he has been doing in the labs here at Arizona State University. So with the Q&A, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A box. So that is where you can put any questions or comments that you have, and I'll help do the moderation um, of those questions for our speakers this evening. So I did see one come through while um, the presentation was happening, and this is more on the, um, the recruitment side of things, so I'll go ahead and answer that now. So students um, that are applying to ASU, you do apply directly to the degree that you want to pursue. So um, the question was, do you have to pick your major right away? Yes, you do, but there is some flexibility um, within changing your major within the first year to year and a half. So it, as you're navigating the different options of um, majors within the Fulton schools, I really highly encourage you to take a look at each school's website. So for example, material science and engineering is part of our school for the engineering of matter, transport, and energy. So if you've absolutely loved our presentation today and you know you wanna work with Dr. Tange, um, applying to materials science would be where you are at. And then other realms of engineering we have as well as mechanical, electrical, there's ultimately 25 choices. So you do have a lot to cho choose from as a prospective student. That's a wonderful question. So what other questions do we have in our audience this evening? I hope, don't be shy people. This is the time to definitely ask any questions you may have. So I'll tee one up while our audience might be thinking of one. So Dr. Tange, can you share a little bit about undergraduate students being able to do research within Fulton, perhaps Absolutely. related to material science? Yeah, well, this is what I like about it, honestly, about material science and engineering. Uh, we are integrated with the undergraduate program, which means our faculty members, they get funding from National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, uh, Depart uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force. That's our major sources of uh, research funding. And these research fundings pile up quite a bit. And all of these research projects, as you may imagine, are rather complex and advanced. And what we do within those projects is that definitely we hire uh, PhD students, we hire master students, we even hire postdocs, but we integrate our undergraduate students as fast as second year. Some of the students want to join in in their first year. Typically, we discourage that because the first year students can be uh, challenged by the number of science uh, courses that they take. And it is their first year in the campus. So uh, there's a lot to get used to. Uh, but starting from second year, typically they get integrated to these research programs. It is not structured, but instead we let our students to look at the faculty profiles see what kind of research going on around and they go reach out to individual faculty members and they eventually find the research that they want to do and then they get training and that training is very important because as you get trained in any instrument let's say scanning electron microscope that we looked at today immediately getting uh getting experience in those kind of units will bump up your salary quite a bit actually so that benefits you in the industry as well as in academia. Maybe you will decide to go in academia. That means you want to do your master's, you want to do your PhD, you want to maybe become a faculty member. That's totally normal. That's totally uh, acceptable. And in that case, you need to slowly build up your resume and your experience as well. So that's our integration with the undergraduate students. 
thank you. So we have a, a few more questions and I'm gonna gear this first one um, to Ruth and then Dr. Tongi, if you wanna chime in as well, I think that'd be wonderful. So Ruth, what has been your favorite course or project as a materials science student? Wow, I, I saw this question a while ago and I've been thinking about it and I'm honestly really not sure. Um, I think that it definitely depends on what your interest is within materials engineering, um, the different professors you have. I would say within my first two years in the program, my favorite class was um, Dr. Tongay's um, MSc 215 class, um, which gives, he provides a brief, basically almost similar to what we did today, an overview of um, different materials, their properties, how we can produce and use them. Um, so that was definitely one of my favorite classes as a like lower division student, just because I felt like I really got a broad introduction to all that material science has to offer. Um, but definitely in these last two years, so my junior and senior year, I would have to say that um, one of my favorite classes was, um, can't remember the name net right now, um, but it was, we looked at different, um, Oh, it was called materials uh, characterization. I'm so sorry. So it was our materials characterization class, which basically what it is was we got to look at all sorts of different ways um, that you could use um, different things like SEM, which we talked about earlier in this presentation to figure out what um, materials um, objects are made out of. Um, and there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, we can harness um, different properties of materials to understand um, what they're made out of, the bonding states of the elements that different materials are made out of, and um, get a better under understanding of why things work the way that they do. And so I really enjoyed that class because I've always been interested in how SEM images work. Um, there's TEM, which is transmission electron microscopy. Um, so different things like that to get to understand really why things do what they do and what they're made out of um, when we don't know. So that was my favorite class so far. Now, Dr. Tung, do you have a favorite class that you like to teach or a class that you see um, a lot of growth within a material science students? Well, clearly I should be teaching this uh, materials characterization class. It sounds so much fun, Ruth. <laughs> um, I, I would say, I mean, each class is unique on its own. Some of the classes are, I'm not going to lie, some of the classes are boring and some of them are fun and some of them are a lot of work, some of them are less work. It just depends. Uh, in your second year, chances are you, you're going to probably like my class the most, which is material synthesis. You're gonna learn many techniques to make new materials. In your third class, probably you're gonna start liking um, microstructures. Um, that's a that's a that's a good class. Thermodynamics will be boring. Kinetics will be okay. In your fourth year, you're gonna probably like this materials characterization that Ruth was talking about. You will make projects um, within within uh, some of our classes. You're gonna start from the beginning to the end. You're gonna design a project. You're gonna finish it, and you're gonna look at that as your accomplishment. So it just depends on where you are in your major. Many classes we have many classes that are great. Some of the classes, as much as they are boring, has to be done. And the faculty try their best not to make it boring. So for example, if you have Dr. Tongay, you'll be enjoying your class no matter how challenging the material is. So we have a couple other good questions out there. I'm gonna jump kind of down the line a little bit to one of our questions about labs. So I'm not sure if this might be related to material science and engineering, but Dr. Tongay or Ruth, do you have um, a knowledge about labs that work with metallurgy on campus? Um, Ruth, do you wanna take this question or do you want me to? <clears throat> um, maybe the it would probably be best if you do it because I don't I don't remember anything other than okay. the, the foundry that sounds class. Good. So when it comes to metallurgy, um, it depends on how you define the metallurgy. I will be very honest. Um, the new contemporary interpretation of metallurgy is characterization and uh, material synthesis integrated together. If that's the case, uh, we have many of them, many, literally. Um, so that's, that's, that's there. If you're talking about a little bit traditional definition of metallurgy, which I believe that's what you're talking about, such as alloying, casting, and all of those, um, we do not have blade smithing class because blade smithing would be a little bit too technical. 
but we do have metallurgy labs. Uh, to my knowledge, we have one in uh, the building that I'm in. Um, we got two more within the chemical uh, chemical sciences buildings. It is not in chemistry, but it's just located in chemical sciences buildings. We got Kumar Ankit working on these. Um, we got uh, Pedro Peralta working on these. And um, yes, so we have metallurgy. Traditional metallurgy is definitely important. And Carl Sratsky also is another faculty member who does metallurgy as well. Thank you. And actually related to that um, is one of the questions that we have here about Fulton being into interdisciplinary when it comes to engineering. So um, absolutely from the staff perspective, I'll share um, with you the structural approach and then Dr. Tanya mm -hmm. and Ruth feel free to chime in as well. Um, so yes, ASU does take a very interdisciplinary approach to not just engineering, but all, all disciplines. And so the idea is that you are applying engineering skills and uh, ability to problem solve in a wide range of options. And uh, there's a lot of choices for students to find the particular area of interest that they want to focus their engineering skills in. So um, there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can do it through research, like Dr. Tange was mentioning earlier. We also have some other um, classes and electives that you can take, such as engineering projects in community service. It's EPEX for short. So it's this idea that you can apply a team of not just engineers, but perhaps um, uh, architects or mathematicians or scientists of other, other disciplines to a, a solving an engineering related problem within a community. So yes, there is definitely an interdisciplinary approach. Um, so, so Ruth, do you have any um, perspective on this as far as your material science background and ways maybe you've par partnered with other engineering students during your time at ASU? Yeah, so I would say that um, one of the opportunities that I had, I would say within Fulton, it wasn't specifically material science and engineering, um, was a class called FSC 301, which is basically an engineering slash business class. So you design and work on a prototype for a business idea. Um, and so that one was really interesting because it wasn't only students in engineering or STEM, but it was also business majors. Um, so in terms of that being interdisciplinary, I think that's one of the um, best kind of experience that I've had. Um, in terms of intersection of STEM with the arts, um, I do know that there was someone who had a capstone project, I believe two years ago, um, where they were a clarinetist, which Dr. Tonga, you may be able to correct me on this one. And so for her capstone project, she actually designed um, synthetic reeds for her clarinet. Um, and I believe ended up winning our kind of like capstone materials competition with her design. So she took her passion for music and her passion for engineering and combined it into um, a project that she might also have gotten patented. Um, and then also, I know some people who are into 3D printing as a form of art. So if that's what you're talking about, um, we have students currently in my capstone class right now who are very much into 3D printing. And so they're working on a project making metallic filament um, for some of the projects that they're working on. So it's definitely an intersection of material science within their passions. Um, so there's lots of ways to do it, especially within your capstone project. Um, if you can come up with a way to do it, you get a whole year basically to pursue things that you love and and have support and um, connections within the school to do that as well. So I would say that's one of your best opportunities to combine those two things. That's a really wonderful example, the arts and material science. It sounds like a perfect combination. <laughs> So I'm gonna take um, two of our questions and, and kind of group them together in a sense from the student's perspective. So the idea of maintaining good grades in whatever engineering discipline you do choose while getting involved in things like extracurriculars or research. So um, how could you maybe give some insight into that, Ruth, is how did you manage being a stellar student that you are with all of the activities that you are engaged in? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the best things that I've learned through engineering and ASU is really like take your first year to um, try out new things, go show up to clubs, um, try different meetings, especially now like as things are on Zoom and I don't know if it'll be that way in the next year, but it's really so easy to go to a meeting, show up, talk to people um, and just start making those connections. And then I would say as you get into your second and third years, really figuring out like who you are and what you want to pursue. So for example, um, I'm currently the vice president of Fulton Ambassadors, which is the engineering tour guides club. And so the reason I chose to do that is because even though I love, 
I love material science and engineering. And so one of my goals was to talk to people about material science and engineering. So that's how I decided to brand myself. Um, whereas that takes some of my time. So that takes time away from um, maybe sports or if I was into art, that would take time away from those things. But I've decided that it's a priority. So I would say that um, you can definitely maintain good grades and participate in extracurriculars. I'm very involved, um, possibly to the point of maybe doing too many things. Um, but definitely make sure that you're evaluating to choose things that are really worth your time and energy because at the end of the day, there are so many great opportunities that you can't do all of them. Um, so really taking a few things and pursuing them well um, and making sure that you do that throughout your four years will help you to stay um, well-rounded and balanced and not burn out. I think that's a wonderful <laughs> answer. So kind of related to that, um, so there's two questions left that we're going to get to in just a moment. But if you have any other questions um, related to the content this evening, we're also happy to help answer really any of the, the nitty gritty, the specifics. Dr. Tonge um, put together this data set for this event. So any questions about the snow and how it forms? For me, I was very blown away that the snow, the consistency changes for our ski slopes. I had no idea. So any of those questions we're happy to answer too. So while you might be thinking of those, Ruth, I'm going to pass you another question. So related to research, can you go a little bit over how you got involved in research and if you have any tips for students? And Dr. Tong, if you have any tips for students that you see as your, your current grad students, a lot of uh, maybe core skills that they've developed that you would like undergraduate students to develop kind of on their trajectory. Um, we'll, we'll talk about research for a little bit. Sounds good. Yeah, so I would say I actually ended up becoming involved in research during my freshman year. Um, and the research I was doing originally in my freshman year was not actually through the schools of engineering. Um, it was a research project studying basically the mindsets that elementary school students have towards stereotypes within STEM. Um, so whether or not girls can do math, whether or not boys are the ones who should have the quote unquote boy jobs, like maybe being a police officer or something like that. Um, so I was actually doing research with um, human subjects, which I would say isn't as typical for an engineer, but I think that really opened doors for me um, into being able to do research well, starting with my second, third and fourth years. Um, so definitely, I would say find something that maybe if you can get your foot in the door, even if it's not something that's totally what you want, because it will give you the experience um, to then try like in my second year when I took a class with Dr. Tange, um, I worked really hard in that class and I actually talked to him after class one day and, and asked him if he had open research positions. And so he was willing to talk to me because I had experience and he had seen the quality of work I was doing in my classes. So um, I would say uh, work to try and find as many opportunities as possible. Talk to your professors. That's one of the biggest things because they're more likely to um, want to talk to you about a research position if you, they know who your face is, if they've seen that you work really hard during class or go to office hours um, or try really hard. And then after that, just continuing to like apply to things and build your skill set um, because we do have really cool hands-on labs and a lot of things that we get opportunities to learn about um, that can really build up your resume. And so um, one of my bigger research projects was actually I spent the summer of 2019 in Germany doing research there. Um, and that application was kind of bolstered by all of the opportunities I had, had at ASU. So it's really just like there have been things I've been rejected from, there have been things I've been accepted to. And so it's really just like connecting with people and trying to find out more of what you're interested in and, and build your resume slowly, even if it's slowly, um, it's still a good thing to really get to the places that you want to go. And now I actually have um, published a paper. So that's really cool. All right. So we have one other question. Um, so it's, uh, let's see here. If you started your college classes in high school, could you then be participating in all of the courses that we've talked about this evening, your first year? So um, yes and no, you are considered an engineer from day one within Fulton. So that's the idea that even in your introductory courses, you are doing active engineering. Um, a lot of it does have a hands-on component to it. So um, regardless of what class you are in, your first year will be um, real engineering. Now, um, participating in college classes in high school is a really wonderful way to get a head start. So for example, if you're taking um, AP Calculus, or if you're taking AP Physics, or AP Chemistry, or any dual enrollment classes, those do count. 
Um, and so a lot of that, what it comes down to is looking at the major map of the degree that you're interested in. So the major map is something you can find online for all ASU programs. It's a complete list of all the classes you would take in that degree and the order in which you would take them. So you can get a sense for what the classes you're bringing in as a high school student count towards and how that helps advance you in that major map towards some of the, the more um, upper division classes. So hopefully that helps answer your question as far as the course load goes. Now, um, do we have any other questions in our audience about our material this evening? So material being material science and engineering, but also anything related to being a student within the Fulton Schools of Engineering or faculty oriented towards Dr. Tange, we're here to help answer them. So we'll stick around for a few more minutes. If there are no questions, I like to add a few more sentences about this interdisciplinary approach to engineering by Claire Novak. I know we explained that and um, we have explained it quite well, but I wanted to add a few more sentences there. Um, do we have any other questions before I go on? With no, that go one? ahead. Jump right okay. into the interdisciplinary. So um, I want to start with the second part of the question. For example, are there opportunities to uh, study at the intersection of STEM with the arts? That's an excellent question because um, I'm going to give one example. Um, my wife is at the uh, College of Design and it is arts and design basically. And me and my wife and some of the other professors have started discussing recently how can we combine material science and engineering with fashion? How can we make more glaring colors? How can we integrate flexible displays into our uh, fashion, into our fabric? How can we combine them both without electrocuting ourselves, of course? We, we got to avoid that. This is one example where it comes uh, comes together when two different disciplines, they have to talk to each other. It is not about necessarily how it is going to fit you. It must fit you. It must be looking good on you. But at the same time, can you add some tech features? How can you make more um, uh, colors that are going to be even different, even like phosphorescent without poisoning you? Those are all very good questions related to material science and engineering. Another uh, interdisciplinary approach is the following. Recently at one actually Thanksgiving party that was a year ago, um, me and one of the other faculty member came together and he is from environmental science and engineering. We started talking together. As we talked more, we came to realize that actually I have spectroscopy techniques that he needs for identifying how plastic in our in the ocean deteriorates and what it breaks down to and how it poisons the fish. So we started looking at that project and then we have created the library of polymers, poisonous polymers using the spectroscopy technique. And we have written a code that allows many of the water uh, processing facilities to look into how they can avoid this, how they can or identify it and whatnot. This is how material science comes together with, as an example, environmental science and engineering. That's another example that I wanted to expand on. At ASU, I can tell you that's our strength. And when I say it is our strength, I cannot mention how much. It is our priority to have interdisciplinary research. The reason is traditional research, traditional material science. MIT does a very good job. Stanford does a very good job. Us trying to compete with them has some meaning, but it is not as meaningful as us creating completely new directions that has never been created by other people. We recognize that, which is why we encourage this interdisciplinary research all across from undergraduate research uh, students all the way to faculty members. I think that's an outstanding place for us to wrap up for the evening. So um, at, at ASU, there's a lot of choices within the Fulton Schools of Engineering. There's a lot of choices. I hope this evening that you've gained some insight into what it means to be a material science engineer. And you got a little bit of some fun holiday spirit 
carrying you in through the, the next few weeks. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. If you have other questions um, about Fulton or material science um, or, or anything after the fact, you're welcome to uh, reach out to me directly. I'll put my contact information in the chat. Um, so if you have any questions, I am here to help answer them. But with that, thank you, Dr. Tongay, so much for your time this evening, helping us learn more about material science and engineering. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining. And really, it means a lot. Happy holidays. Yes. And Merry Christmas. Happy holidays.